On today's Two on Your Side Town Hall, get vaxxed, ditch the mask. The CDC loosens up the guidelines for face coverings for those fully vaccinated. A local infectious disease expert joins us live with reaction. Plus, was it a shortage or panic buying? The Verify team getting to the bottom of that run on fuel that we saw down south earlier this week. And we're going to get you ready for one of the biggest events ever to come to the Buffalo waterfront, or rather the sky above it. Really looking forward to that live conversation that we will have at the end of the half hour. We're glad you're here with us. And first up, for more than a year, masks have really become a part of everyday life for so many of us. If you're fully vaccinated, though, you could start to soon see some big changes. So the CDC announced new guidance this afternoon. In most situations, if you are fully vaccinated, you can stop wearing your mask. That is just guidance right now, we should note. It is up to individual states and businesses to decide their own rules. And Governor Cuomo just released a statement that the state will be reviewing the new guidance with our surrounding states. The CDC says everyone should still wear masks on planes and trains and at airports and transit hubs, mass transit, and also in places like hospitals and doctor's offices. The head of that agency says rising vaccination rates and dropping cases, along with some new studies, led to this decision. This past year has shown us that this virus can be unpredictable. So if things get worse, there is always a chance we may need to make change to these recommendations. But we know that the more people are vaccinated, the less cases we will have and the less chance of a new spike or additional variants emerging. And joining us live right now to talk about this is Dr. John Selick, hospital epidemiologist with Kaleida Health. He sees patients at the VA hospital. Doctor, it's great to see you as always. Thanks for your time. Thanks for having me again. So Dr. Selick, we want to start just by getting your reaction to the announcement. Of course, it's something that we know people have waited to hear for a long time. You know, I, I think we've uh, really understood all along that this was going to be an evolutionary process that, you know, we weren't just going to get to to point X and then everything was going to stop. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of rumor and a lot of chit chat on the you know various professional uh, websites and listservs uh, that something was coming. And I think we're finally at the point where we have a, a pretty good amount of data, uh, particularly with the, uh, you know, the stunning success of these vaccines, their efficacy in preventing infection, uh, that we're now at the point that we can start to loosen things up. But as you guys pointed out, uh, you know, this doesn't mean, uh, you know, just go out and throw your mask away. Uh, you know, there's still going to be some restrictions and certainly we're going to have to wait and see how Albany and, and Erie County and, and even some businesses, how they uh, weigh in on this. But at least now uh, we have some science behind this to tell us that uh, this is a safe thing to do. Yeah, and Dr. Selig, just to pick up on that, I mean, we know that the science hasn't changed overnight, but there is kind of this constant stream of new data coming in and new analyses coming in. Um, so that's part of this. But also, what do you feel about kind of the pressure that was on the CDC? I mean, it seemed like even Dr. Fauci, who is not part of the CDC, he's a, with another part of government, but it seemed like even he in the, over the past few days was kind of signaling the science is telling us that we can loosen up some of these restrictions. And if we don't do it, um, then the CDC kind of faced this risk of, of looking like they're not following the science. Right. Yeah, I, I think this is very true. Uh, you know, the CDC by nature has always been uh, fairly conservative with this stuff because what you don't want to do is say, yeah, everything is good, and then it turns out that it's not, and then you have to walk it back. So I think there's always been uh, that, um, you know, that part of them. Uh, but I think now the, you know, the data really have just been, uh, uh, you know, coming in in, in a, a pretty steady stream now, like I said, especially with the efficacy of these vaccines. And I think that, uh, you know, Dr. Fauci and a number of other people, uh, you know, have really pointed out that, uh, you know, if we want people to continue to, you know, for us to dig into that last group of vaccine hesitant people, uh, giving them something to look forward to, that if you get vaccinated, your life is going to get better. So I think that, uh, you know, again, there is, uh, you know, there's always yin and yang with uh, what the CDC does. And, and I think that, uh, you know, they're starting to uh, uh, see, uh, you know, being able to go back to being an evidence based organization that we can make some of these changes. You know, we talked about this being guidance that people who are fully vaccinated aren't required to wear masks in most places, but there are still people who are getting sick. 
uh, from COVID-19. In your medical opinion, are there situations where even vaccinated people should maybe still choose to wear masks or do you think they're pretty safe at this point? You know, talk about it being an evolution. There's certainly that idea that we've been wearing them for so long that you think, really, is it okay? <laughs> yeah, no, and, and I think, uh, Kate, you stated that very well. And this is the uh, this is the question that I've been getting a lot from people in the last couple of weeks. Is it really, can I actually do this? Uh, you know, can I take my mask off? And I think for the most part, we're going to be safe. I, I think that I think we still have the concerns, uh, you know, healthcare facilities, uh, very close quarters, like on airplanes and buses and trains, uh, uh, you know, situations like that, where you have a lot of people together. I think there's going to be some concern about international travel because of some of the uh, virus variants that are circulating in other parts of the world that, uh, you know, especially if you're traveling through an international airport uh, where you may come in contact people with people from those uh, settings. I think that, uh, you know, you, you may want to be a little bit more cautious, but I think for most of our stuff, you know, now going out to a restaurant, uh, going out with friends, I think we're, uh, you know, we're getting to where we want to be on this. Yeah, one viewer sent me an email a short time ago saying, how are we going to know when we go out places if people are vaccinated or not? Because yeah. what if you're not vaccinated and you choose not to wear the mask? So there, there's a lot to to work out with yeah. all this. But in the, the minute that we have left here, I want to ask you also about something so important to so many people watching right now, and that is, of course, schools and our, our kids being in class. Um, the head of the country's second largest teachers union said today that all schools should be fully reopened five days a week by the fall, the next school year. Um, what does the science tell us right now about how achievable that is? I, I think this is very achievable. And I think especially now with the uh, Pfizer vaccine being, uh, being uh, uh, you know, getting the emergency approval uh, for the uh, 12 to 15 year old uh, age group, I think that uh, the, uh, you know, the way things are moving, that if all the teachers are vaccinated, kids get vaccinated, uh, and we uh, are careful uh, with all of the extracurricular activities and sports and, and such, uh, I would fully expect that we're going to be able to go to school in the fall and potentially, uh, I know there's not much left to the spring semester, uh, but potentially even now, uh, when you look at our metrics for Western New York, we're getting you know, very close to that level uh, that CDC is set for, uh, you know, being able to change some of the distant, uh, you know, spacing guidance and such. So I, I think we're uh, getting where we want to be on that as well. We've been talking to Dr. John Selleck, hospital epidemiologist with Kaleida Health, who also practices at the VA hospital. We always appreciate your expertise. As you say, it's an evolution. So we're glad to have you with us to, to talk right. us through it. Right. We're almost up right now. So we're, we're continuing to evolve. So this is good. Absolutely. Dr. Right. Selleck, thank you so much. So this Thanks week on again. the town hall, we've been talking about that gas pipeline shutdown and our verify team is now looking into what was really behind those images we saw of all these cars lined up at gas stations. Yeah, a lot of people have asked, was there actually a shortage of fuel? Gabe Cohen verifies the answer. Gas pumps along the East Coast are running out of fuel. It's tied to a cyber attack at one of the biggest pipelines in the U.S. But what's causing the shortage is a bit more complicated. So let's verify. Did the Colonial Pipeline hack lead to a gas shortage in the Southeast? Our sources, the Association for Convenience and Fuel Retailing, Gas Buddy, and AAA Gas Prices. Colonial Pipeline, which supplies 45% of gas on the East Coast, shut down all operations last week during a ransomware attack, which is being blamed on a dark web hacker group. That sparked the trending hashtag Gas Shortage 2021 and claims of looming price hikes and supply shortages. The pipeline shutdown is causing some supply chain issues with less fuel available at regional terminals and the industry already facing a shortage of delivery drivers to get gas to the pumps. The Association for Convenience and Fuel Retailing tells us normally retailers can expand their zone for finding supply when there are distribution challenges, but that's a little harder right now. But officials say there should have been enough gas in the short term. The bigger problem is panic buying. 
drivers are rushing to top off their tanks, with gas stations seeing two to four times the normal demand. Now, many stations across the southeast are dry, with fuel outages Thursday at 68% of North Carolina stations and close to half of Virginia, South Carolina, D.C., and Georgia, according to Gas Buddy. The website explained in a post, tank farms that take the gasoline from the pipeline are likely starting to see supply run low, so it is vital that motorists do not overwhelm the system by filling their tanks. If motorists hoard gasoline, the problem may stretch for several weeks with continued outages and further pricing impacts. The national average gas price is up eight cents from a week ago, according to AAA, the first time it's topped three dollars since 2014. On Wednesday, Colonial Pipeline restarted their operations, saying it will take several days for the supply chain to return to normal. So we can verify, yes, the Colonial Pipeline hack caused supply chain issues and panic buying, which led to a gas shortage at the pump in the southeast. With your Verify, I'm Gabe Cohen. And a footnote here, of course, we learned that Colonial has fully restarted the pipeline after paying that ransom of $5 million. They paid it.